Um, last week, Sean got to introduce us to our new study in the book of Acts. Um, just to quickly summarize where some of those things, Acts is the, the second book. It's like the uh, volume two of what Luke wrote. Uh, Luke wrote the book of Luke, and he also wrote the book of Acts. Uh, the, the book of Luke starts with um, John the Baptist being born and Jesus being born, and then it worked all the way up until Jesus ascending into heaven. And then when we pick up in the, the book of Acts, it actually shifts over just a little bit, starts in right when Jesus rose from the grave and he spends those 40 days with his disciples, and then he ascends, and then it continues to talk about the, the development and the expansion of the Christian church afterwards. And so Luke and Acts work hand in hand. They're, they're written to the same person, they're written by the same person, and there's even some overlap. And last week, we uh, went through the very beginning of Acts, and not surprisingly, some of the verses look very similar. And so uh, we're going to Focus on one part of those verses, uh, but actually looking at the part from Luke. So we're going to be in, in uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 49. So why don't you go ahead and, and open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, verse 49. My Bible has this in red letters, so that means this is Jesus talking. These are some of the last words that he's saying to his disciples before he ascends into heaven. And here it says, I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Uh, let's go ahead and, and pray. God, I am so thankful for your word. I am so thankful for the chance that we have to, to come together, to praise you together, to, to worship you together, to learn about you. And Lord, I'm so thankful that... Um, you have these things for us to learn. I personally thank you that I had a chance to learn this stuff, and, and I just hope that we as a church can learn something as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is, I was so excited about getting to, to study this because this is a new challenge for me. Uh, when I was, normally when I speak, Sean is usually between sermon series or something, so I just get to talk on whatever I want. This is my first assigned role. Like, all right, Dallas, you, here's your verse, you're preaching on this. And I tell you what, it turned into such a blessing for me because I got to learn so much. So I really hope that I can give some of that knowledge out to you guys because for me personally, this is just a great learning experience. One of the things I learned, because the first thing I did when I read this verse is I saw, okay, I'm going to send you what my father has promised. What my father, so again, this is Jesus, so this is what God has promised. Well, it seems like in the things I've read that there's been lots of promises. So what do you mean it's going to send what God has promised? Hasn't God promised a lot of different things? And when we look at the context, and actually if we look in the, the book of Acts, uh, it even records it that we recognize that this is talking about the Holy Spirit. And so when, it's, when God's saying that I'm going to send what I promised, he's talking about that he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that I was very surprised when I got to read into this is, for whatever reason, I had the misconception that the Holy Spirit was kind of, for, for these disciples, a new idea. That this was something that wasn't talked about very much. This was this radically new thing that, you know, not only did Jesus, you know, turn over a lot of beliefs that people had had about the church and about God, but now he introduces this whole idea of a Holy Spirit. Spirit. But here it, it implies that the Holy Spirit has been talked about way before. And so there's several verses I want to go through. And instead of having you guys turn to all of them, I'm just going to read some of them to you just to save time and to, to save your poor Bibles from being too worn out. Uh, but if, if you want to go through these, please, by all means, come see me afterwards. I have all these verses printed off. I'd love to be able to share them with you. Um, but if you don't mind, just trust me to read some of them. That's, that's the route we'll go. Um, so one of the times that we see the Holy Spirit talking about is in Joel chapter 2, and he says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And in Ezekiel, God claims out, I will pour my spirit within you and you will come to life. And if you look through Isaiah, Isaiah has countless times as it's going through, he talks about, I'm going to 
pour out my spirit on your descendants. I will, I will give your descendants my spirit. And through my spirit, your descendants will be, and he goes through that several different times. And so this idea of the Holy Spirit was not a new idea. In fact, as we're reading through it, the Jews had traditionally been waiting for two things. They were waiting for the Messiah to come, to revolutionize things and bring his nation back. That's what they were expecting. So they were expecting the, the, the Messiah to come, but they were also expecting and looking forward to a day when the Holy Spirit would come. Why is that significant? Well, in, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit didn't dwell on everybody. It mainly dwelled on either the king, if there was a king, or a prophet would be speaking to God. And, and at one point, it was maybe just this part of a nation, but the Holy Spirit was not on everybody. Here, Jesus says, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. And so these Jews were expecting two things. They were expecting the Messiah, which had now come. Jesus had uh, proven himself to be the Messiah. He came and he, he did die, but he rose from the dead and he got to spend days with them and he did later ascend into heaven. And so the Messiah that they were so excited about had come and was now going back to heaven. So now they're excited about this new phase where the Holy Spirit is going to be sent out and be on us. So that's, the, that's an exciting part. So the, to, to us, it might look like it was a new idea, but to them it wasn't. They've been looking forward to the Holy Spirit coming for the God's Spirit to be poured out on them for quite a long time. And so then kind of comes the second question that I had was, okay, what's the big deal? It, yeah, that sounds like something, okay, the Holy Spirit will fall on all people, but what's, what's really the big deal about that? And Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit countless times through, through, his, through his days. He only had three years of ministry. That always surprises me when I remember that. Oh, Jesus did all these things in only three years. And many of his messages, he talks about the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, he refers to the Holy Spirit as the counselor. Uh, some translations have that as the, the, the comforter. The idea that the Holy Spirit is with you all the time and he is for you. That the, the Spirit of God is not leaving you. It's not that you're stuck here and or the only time that you have the Spirit is when you're in church. God's Spirit does not dwell here. The Spirit of God gets to go with you and comforts you and guides you and is with you at all times. That's one of the things that's significant about the Holy Spirit. Uh, another thing that's significant about the Holy Spirit we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is that the Holy Spirit is the one that gives spiritual gifts. Maybe you've come across those before or heard those. There, in, in that 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he goes through saying that there's the gift of wisdom and knowledge and healing, miraculous powers prophecy, faith. I always have to remind myself that faith is actually a spiritual gift. We, we, we talk about that in the Christian faith. Well, the gift of having faith, that is a spiritual gift. Distinguishing between spirits, speaking in tongues or different languages, being able to translate different languages. These are all different gifts that the spirit gives. We might think of that as, oh, we have these natural born abilities by God. Well, yeah, there's that, but there's also a spiritual side where the Spirit will give you a gift. Why do we each have gifts? When, when you continue reading the scripture, these gifts are brought into realize, or they're, the analogy is brought up that just like your body has many parts, they're all very different. They all have different functions. Those different functions of the body work together to make one body. So when the Spirit gives all of us different gifts, we're supposed to use those different gifts to help unify us. Not everybody here has the same gift. That's if you think about it, that's a good thing. If all of us were uh, speakers, that would not be a very good thing. If, we, if our Sundays were just getting together and everybody talking at the same time, that would not be a good thing. We, we need somebody to have the gift of speaking. We need to have somebody that has wisdom. We need to have somebody that has faith, that trusts God to take that next step. We need people that have the a gift of knowledge and being able to discern between good and evil spirits. We need all these different gifts. And so when the Holy Spirit you know, gives all these different gifts, one, we get to be excited about being part of ministry, but then also it unifies us and brings us together. So this Holy Spirit, it is a comforter. It is a counselor. It guides us. He's with us at all times. He gives us spiritual gifts. Another thing that we read is in uh, Romans chapter 8. Paul talks about that the mind of sinful man is death. 
mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. Here, when Paul's talking about the mind, he's talking about what you're focusing on. What are your goals? The mind that's fixated on doing something. So my goals are to do this. If your goal is to be on sinful nature, then it's death. And when we talk about that, I strongly believe that he's not just talking about a spiritual death, but a physical death as well. Because the sinful nature is where you start finding those um, addictions, a chemical addiction, a physical addiction, uh, an emotional addiction to something. You see other things like hatred and greed and anger, all these things that really tear apart people's lives. I I had a, a brother that had a, a physical uh, addiction to alcohol. And sure enough, that ended his life very shortly. Uh, it wasn't just, a, you know, for, for people, when we talk about these being led by a sinful nature, it's not just a, a, a spiritual death that's coming, but it could very well shorten our physical lives too. But then he says, but the mind that's controlled by the spirit is life. We use that word life sometimes to describe people, don't we? They're like, oh man, that person is so full of life. You know, well, what do we mean by that? Well, we mean that person is excited. They're joyful. They're happy. They're just glad to be alive. And when they walk in, there's just this positive energy that they bring into the room. And Paul says that if a person is being led by the Spirit, that they are going to have life. Not just an everlasting spiritual life, but there is here a life that they just have life in them. And another thing that makes me excited is that there is a peace. So we start noticing this Holy Spirit has lots of things going on. And there's still so much more. There, there's another one. This one I relate to very well. In John chapter 16, uh, Jesus is in the last message that he gives his disciples before he goes to the cross. So he's kind of gathered them about and he's, he's doing his last message with them. And he says this verse to, you, to them, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into truth. I think the reason I understand this verse a little bit and I can see what Jesus probably saw is the fact that I am a teacher and even more specifically a math teacher. Uh, there, there's certain days I'll be going in and I'll have in my head, all right, we're going to go in today. We're going to learn about these three topics and I'll go and I'll have the class. I'll have them engaged and I'll go through the first topic. And as I'm finishing that first topic and going into the second topic, I can just see that look on my student's face. Just glazed over just there, there's nothing and I can tell it's not always that they're trying to be defiant or that they're just not paying attention or that they're super sleepy there's times that I am going through this content I can just tell that okay they have reached their maximum ability to learn for that day there is nothing else that I can cram into their head if I choose to continue teaching I'm going to have to reteach that the next day because they didn't they are not going to get anything else and so what do I have to do as a teacher? I have to stop, I have to pause, and we have to go over that stuff that you can tell they're wrestling with. Not that they're not trying, just you can just tell that their, their minds in the development state that they're in, they are just stuck there, and they need to go over it. Jesus had that same response when he was looking at the disciples. I have so much that I want to tell you, but I can tell right now that it's more than you can bear. It's more than you can handle. I have so much more I want to tell you, but I, if I tell you, you're still going to be thinking about the last thing I said. You're not going to hear anything else. So I can't tell you anymore. And if we stopped there, we would be real discouraged. If we stopped there, we'd think, man, Jesus had so much more. That three years of ministry, think of what if God would have allowed him to be here for 15? What if he could have been here for a full 50 days of ministry? What if there is that part of it? That was only three years. But Jesus gives hope with it. He says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into truth. So the Holy Spirit does something miraculous. The Holy Spirit continues to teach us truth. The Holy Spirit continues to teach us the difference between right and wrong. The Holy Spirit continues to show us what Jesus was showing us, which is how to have a correct and true relationship with the Father. This Holy Spirit continues to minister to us. The, the work that God had for us and the things that God wanted to teach us didn't end when Jesus ascended into heaven. In fact, it just continued in a different way. The things that God wants to show us is still revealed to us through this Holy Spirit. So you're starting to catch on this Holy Spirit is a big deal. Uh, he, he's with us. He's 
uh, with us all the time. He's comforting us. He's counseling us. He's um, giving us different spiritual gifts. He's given us life. He's given us uh, the ability to continue to learn. In fact, in Luke chapter 12, when the disciples are concerned, like, well, how am I going to stand up? How am I going to know what to say? Jesus uh, comforts them and says, look, when you are persecuted, when you are given trials of many kinds, when you are before people and they challenge you and they ask you uh, how you're doing these things, the Holy Spirit will teach you what to say. And so this Holy Spirit will help you. And so that's, for me, one of the biggest questions I always have, especially now when you hear about all these um, people that are being persecuted and imprisoned and even killed for their belief, there comes that common question, could I do that? Would I have the strength to be able to say that I'm a follower of Jesus if I knew that there was a gun to my head? Or if I knew that, you know, could I do that? Or what if one of my coworkers, if you know, I'm in a, a secular school, so there's lots of coworkers there that, that don't believe in the Father or, or in God. And so what if one of those people ask me why I believe what I believe? Will I really know what to say? And you can start getting nervous about that. But in Luke, it talks about how the Holy Spirit will guide your words, will help teach you what to say, will, will help you know what to say at the right moment. And uh, another thing that, and this is a, a scripture I do want us to turn to. So if you could turn to Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 5, we start um, this, or Paul uh, talks about this thing of the fruit of the Spirit. So the fruit of the Spirit, that's such a church word. Once I started uh, helping out with youth ministry and got more involved with this, I started realizing that there are lots of church phrases we say and don't really think about, well, what does that mean? Um, and I got that because uh, the youth groups I've been able to be part of, including this one, we have lots of kids that have not grown up in the church. In fact, there's several kids that are part of our youth group that their families do not go here. The reason that they're here is because they walk here from home. Uh, and so there, there's people that didn't grow up in the church. And so some of these phrases, I know for me, I take... Um, I, I take advantage of where I'm like, okay, fruit of the spirit. Yeah, I've heard of fruit of the spirit for a long time, but fruit of the spirit to somebody that might not realize that just kind of could be lost. And so I want to make sure we understand fruit of the spirit. We know what type of a tree is by what kind of fruit it bears. For example, when I went back to Michigan with my wife for one of the first times, I had no clue there was that many different types of cherry trees. There are an immense amount of different types of cherry trees. Kind of like, um, you know, I just thought there was the bright red ones that you get in your cherry Coke, and then there was the darker ones that you could actually eat. You know, or then there was the dried kind that you could cover in chocolate, and that's delicious as well. But you know, the when I went back there, they started talking about, oh, well, is that a, a semi-sour? Is that a tart? Is that a Queen Anne? And I'm like, what there's different types of cherries there there i didn't know there is this much and when you look at the trees you can't really tell the difference if you're just looking at it, like yeah it's a cherry tree but once it starts producing fruit you realize oh that's a tart or oh that's a semi-sweet oh that's a queen anne and there's all these different types of uh, different types of cherry trees and you don't quite realize that until it starts bearing fruit Kind of the same thing with apples. It seems like we're a little more familiar with apples. Is that a Granny Smith? Is it a red apple? Is it a Fiji apple? Is it a Honeycrisp apple? You just see an apple tree, and you don't really know what that is until it starts bearing fruit. When we talk about fruits of the Spirit, we're saying, okay, if the Spirit is in you, these will be the things that come out. This will be the fruit. This will be proof of the Spirit is working in you. And here it first starts by talking about what uh, some of that, what the fruit are, somebody that's not led by the Spirit. Uh, the, the acts of the sinful nature, this is in verse 19, so Galatians 5, 19, the acts of sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. Doesn't this sound like fun? Dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, so the results of a person that is living by the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
There is a radical transformation between a person controlled by sinful nature and the person controlled by the Spirit of God. There's a big argument going on right now, you know, especially you know, in, the, in the wake of all the terrorism attacks, domestic and international, um, other things. You know, with, uh, there's all these battles, and so people start talking about they want to find something to blame. Well, it's, it's society and culture because evil is a learned behavior. People aren't naturally born that way. And I've finally come to the decision, that person that's making that claim doesn't have kids. <laughs> they, they, have not, they have not seen what a kid is like when they're first born. Uh, one of my favorite stories is Jackson when he was about a year old. He, he wasn't even quite a year. He was 10 months. And at that age, I started recognizing that I did not have to teach Jackson to be evil. <laughs> I did not have, and I'll say, I'm not saying that Jackson's, Jackson is a wonderful kid. I love Jack. He's such a cute kid. But anyways, when he was about 10 months old, so he wasn't even walking yet, but he had learned to pull himself up onto things. So if the couch was there, he could pull himself up. And if the TV cabinet was there, he could pull himself up. Well, a lot of friends of friends had put in a lot of scary stories for me with this pulling up by TV cabinets because I actually knew of a couple people where the TV had fallen over. You know, one of the disadvantages of these flat screen TVs that they were a lot easier to fall over. And so we got real paranoid about Jackson crawling and being around the, the TV. Problem was, our cable box had this beautiful light that was on it. <laughs> and if Jackson pulled himself up on that TV cabinet, he could stare directly into the light. And so as, as my wife and I are sitting, we're watching Jackson. He scoots his way over and he pulls himself up on the TV cabinet and automatically seems to staring at it. And he starts reaching. And Shauna see real quick, he goes, Jackson? No, no. And so he just looks at her. And his attention slowly goes back to the light. He's staring at it. And he's not doing anything at first. You know, he's just, he did, really is just staring, but kind of like that, you ever watch Bugs Life and you see that bug that gets drawn to the bug zapper? He's like, oh, it's so pretty. I can see that kind of going in my son's head as he starts, I got to touch the light. I got to touch it. Jackson, no. And he stops and he looks back. The third time was a little bit more interesting because now Jackson's staring at the light again. But instead of reaching for it automatically, he does this. And watch his mom the entire time as he's reaching for the light. I'm like, you little stinker. At 10 months old, he's already trying to test his boundaries and see what can I get away with. I know I'm not supposed to touch this light, but I really want to touch it. Will I still get in trouble if I'm looking at her? And so he's already testing the limits of what can I get away with. He didn't have to, teach or have to be taught that. He didn't have to learn to test the limits. He didn't have to learn to want to do something that he knew he wasn't supposed to. Mom just told him seconds ago that he's not supposed to touch the light. But he's just naturally born that way. And we, we recognize this, that it's a lot easier for a kid to learn bad behavior than it is for that kid to learn good behavior. In fact, here it talks about how it really takes the fruit of the spirit, that it takes the Holy Spirit coming into your life to start developing this good behavior. Yeah, we can train our kids to do certain things, but when we start talking about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can change the heart. And then we can start having these things come out of it. And here's the hard thing. Here's the thing that really hit me really hard when I was studying this is this fruit of the Spirit, that, that if we're supposed to be led by the Spirit, we're not just supposed to be led by the Spirit while we're here at church. You know, all those things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, yeah, that's a lot easier when we're sitting in our chairs at church. But what about when we walk out the doors? We're supposed to be led by the Spirit at all times. So that means for, for many of us, in our marriage, we are supposed to have evidence of the Holy Spirit being part of that. We are supposed to have love. Okay, that's an easy one. Love, I love my wife. Joy, peace, patience. Right there, I just lost a lot of you women with your husbands. Uh, the, the Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That starts getting to be a little more difficult. And I'm going to take it even a step further, not just only in this loving relationship that you're supposed to have with your spouse, but with all of your family members and with all of your friends, you're supposed to be showing these different fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. Oh, there's that patience again. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
I'm going to take it even a step further. Like this, if you start really, like, this is hard to do. Start thinking of your workplace. Start thinking of that annoying coworker that you always avoid at every single cost. This person, we're supposed to still be led by the Spirit in all the things we do, even at work. And so that means at work, we're supposed to be filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This isn't going to be an easy task. In fact, um, you might even start to wonder, like, is this even possible? You know, is this work of the Holy Spirit, is that really possible in all these things? Like, that just seems like it can't be done. There, there's no way that that can be done. And so we look to the Bible and we see that there are some specific examples of the Holy Spirit working in people, and we can see how it has completely changed their lives. In fact, one person that we can see the Holy Spirit working in is actually Jesus. When Jesus got baptized, there's this verse that we quickly, I know I say we, I quickly looked over where it says that he was led into the desert. I guess I just always thought, oh, well, Jesus was led. He had this hunch. Oh, God wants me to go to the dead. It was probably this supernatural natural connection between God and Jesus, where Jesus heard God say, go to the desert. Okay. Well, it says that he was led by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit was leading even Jesus. And when he went out there, he was following the Spirit's direction. And later on, when we see all the miraculous signs that Jesus is doing, the religious leaders come to him and start challenging him, by whose authority are you doing this? And as you keep reading the story, we find out that they even accuse him of using demonic power. Like, are you casting out demons by demon power? And Jesus he argues with him and says, no, that's silly. Why would a kingdom be divided against itself? I do these miraculous signs by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of God. He, and so we recognize that Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit to do all these great things that he did. When we look at Peter, good old Peter, I love Peter. I think it's because a lot of people love Peter, and I think it's because we relate to Peter. Because Peter was this guy that was just crazy and rash, and you know, he was the person that jumped out of the boat and started walking on water. But then what did he do? He started doubting, and he started to sink. And then as he's talking about who Jesus is, and Jesus says, Man, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And he's so bold, he says, no, I wouldn't deny you three times. And sure enough, what does he do? He gets challenged. Jesus is arrested. People are wondering, Peter, are you one of his disciples? I think I saw you with the disciples. No, it wasn't me. And he does it three times. The same Peter that had that weakness, later on, we find out, does some amazing things. Uh, at the time of Pentecost, which we'll study later on with, uh, in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit fell on Peter, and he gave one of the boldest, most radical sermons ever to a big crowd of people. And now, not only is he talking about Jesus, but he even starts to accuse them. Like, look... Here's Jesus. He was the Messiah, the one that you crucified, the one that you persecuted, the one that you rejected and started going after these people. And then through that, after he boldly accused them, says, but you also have this hope. And then he began to describe the hope that they had. And later on, when uh, Peter started doing miraculous signs, as they were walking, there was a, a beggar that was asking, hey, do you have any gold or silver? And Peter said, gold and silver, I have none. But what I give you I give you with the, with, through the Holy Spirit, through the Spirit of God, and he heals the man. That man goes before the Sanhedrin. They're wondering what's going on. The Sanhedrin call in Peter, and they challenge him. By whose authority are you doing this? And again, Peter, remember, this is the same Peter that denied Jesus months ago. This is the same Peter that denied that he even knew who he was, that he was a follower. This same person is now standing before the church leaders, the religious leaders that he knows just killed his leader. And he again accuses them. You guys killed the person by whose authority I'm doing this. You guys did all, you guys turned Jesus away. And he gets whipped and he gets flogged and then he walks out rejoicing. This same Peter had a radical transformation, not because he matured, not because he just got older, but because the Holy Spirit had now come on him to where now he has the strength to do these things. This Holy Spirit is a crazy, radical thing that is empowering us to live like we've never lived before. As it says in Romans again, to give you life. That is awesome. That is something that we should be so excited about. 
And when we, when we look at that, we just think, man, God, thank you. And how can you use this? One of the things we do is we look back at uh, Luke chapter 24, as he says, I'm going to send you what my father has promised. All right, so what does he promise? He's promised the Holy Spirit. And that's all that we just, just talked about. And so he promised the Holy Spirit. But then Jesus challenges the disciples and says, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Because here's the thing. Jesus recognized that is, if the disciples left, without having the Holy Spirit. If they went out in their own power, they were going to fail miserably. If, the, if they were charged and going out and spreading the gospel and talking about Jesus and standing before religious leaders and standing under great persecution, they would all have failed miserably. Peter uh, already failed by starting to walk on water and then doubting and sinking. That would have happened exactly the same way. But Jesus challenged them saying, stay in the sea until you've been clothed with power from on high. And so for me, there came the second question of, okay, so how do I know that I've been powered from on high to do the next step? Because every step that we're supposed to take is supposed to be through the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to follow his leading. And one time that I really had a, a big time that I was seeking the Lord's direction was when I almost did a huge career change. I, I was looking at... Um, my school, which it wasn't going very well, I was at the spot where I was just about ready to quit. And right about that time when I'm already discouraged with being a teacher, discouraged with teaching, I get this opportunity from a church that says, hey, why don't you come work for us full time? Why don't you stop teaching and you can be a full time person here at the church? And there came this big decision for me. And I wrestled with it and I had a hard time figuring out, okay, Holy Spirit, what, where are you leading me? I think one of the reasons why we often doubt is we've had those moments in our lives where we've gone a direction and we thought maybe we were following the Holy Spirit, but then we had kind of a big, you know, we find out that we weren't following the Holy Spirit, that we were following our own selfish ambitions, and then we recognize that we're in a spot that we never were supposed to be in. I remember having some of those with, for whatever reason for me, it was some different relationships. But my, my choices with, with ladies were not always the best growing up. I didn't, and sometimes I would get too deep in the relationship, even though that's not where I was supposed to be. And so when those things start to fail, you look back at these moments when you have followed the wrong direction. And so you start second guessing yourself. Well, how do I know if I'm following the Holy Spirit? How do I know if this is where God's directing me? If the Holy Spirit has this amazing power that that can change somebody like Peter, how can I allow him to change me? How can I trust God to lead me in this direction? And so I did a lot of uh, studying. I got together with uh, poor Pastor Sean that you know, shared a cup of coffee with me for two hours. Uh, and then through, through that and through uh, reading a lot, I came up with three things that uh, I thought were helpful when you're trying to decide, is this the Holy Spirit that's leading me to do something? And the first thing that I, I realize is that if you're feeling that the Holy Spirit's leading you somewhere, it must agree with Scripture. So that's the first thing. It must agree with Scripture. Because the same... Um, we often think of that a whole bunch of people wrote this book. Well, that's true. A lot of different people's hands wrote this book, but the same Spirit wrote this book. The same Holy Spirit inspired the words of the person to write this book. And if it's the same God yesterday, today, and forever, that means the Holy Spirit that wrote these uh, verses way back when, over 2,000 years ago, that means that same God is going to say the same thing now. And so if you are tempted to go a direction and it is against scripture, then it's not of God. It must agree with scripture. Another verse that I really enjoyed was in John chapter 14, verse 26, that Jesus, again, talking about the Holy Spirit says, he will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said. The Holy Spirit will even bring to your mind these scriptures, which also shows the importance of studying scripture. But the Holy Spirit will bring to your, your mind that you can remember these different scriptures as you're debating on something. When Jesus was led into the desert, if you've ever looked at it real closely, you'll notice that Jesus defended himself, that fought against Satan by using scripture. 
scary part is that Satan was also using scripture. So you do need to make sure that you understand scripture. But when Jesus was tempted to do things, the way he fought off that temptation was by using scripture. And so if we ever feel God's leading, we got to first of all, make sure does this agree with scripture? The second thing that we need to make sure we always do is to pray. We, there's a verse that says that we need to pray without ceasing. There's another verse that talks about the Holy Spirit, how it will pray on your behalf, even when you don't understand or know how to pray or know what you need to pray for. The Holy Spirit is this connection that allows us to be connected with God. Without the Holy Spirit, we would have a separation between us and God. But the Holy Spirit allows us to have a connection. And so if we're praying, then it's at that moment that we can receive direction from the Holy Spirit. And so as we're, as we're praying, we first of all need to check and make sure that we are agreeing with Scripture, but we also need to make sure that we're talking with God, that we are not only talking and presenting things, but we need to make sure that we're on the receiving end as well, that we're allowing the Holy Spirit to talk to us, because He does still want to talk to us. I hope I can speak that truth in you. The Holy Spirit is still wanting to help guide us. And some people, it might be an audible voice. It's not for me. I don't hear an audible voice, um, but it, it, He can still talk to you and through you through the Holy Spirit. And then the third thing is to ask yourself the question, does it produce fruit? Again, going back to that fruit, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. And here's the biggest one for me, peace. If I am trying to follow the Holy Spirit, then I am going to have a peace about it. And notice it doesn't say easy. When we look at the fruits of the Spirit, it does not say that it's going to be easy. But it does say that it's going to be peaceful, that you will have a peace about it. And so as you're seeking God's direction, maybe you're looking at a, a, a big physical move. Maybe you're looking at moving to some different place. Maybe you're looking at a career change. Maybe you're looking at some big step with your family. And all the things that you're doing, you always need to look and see, okay, does this move, will it produce fruit? Am I going to have peace about this? Again, that there's a difference between easy and peace. Not saying that, oh, this is the easy thing for me to do, but do I have peace about this? And so that becomes our, our big thing. And, that, and for me, that was just something that I was able to walk away with and I was super excited about because I think I needed this. This is something that I needed to, to have, and, and God just really was able to work with me, so I was super excited about it, that, um, that the Holy Spirit is wanting to work in us and through us um, still to this day. You know, Jesus' ministry did not end when he ascended, but Jesus' ministry is still at work, and he's still wanting to work in us and through us because he is our counselor. He is our comforter. He will teach us what to say. He will remind us of scriptures when we need it. And he is going to give us power, just like the power that he gave the disciples as they went and spread out the gospel to all the earth. And that is what a great hope that it is. And so as you guys are, are going away, I just hope that we can kind of remember the, that we've got to agree with scripture. We've got to pray about it and then ask yourself, does it produce fruit? Amen. Amen. All right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and pray that together. God, I am so thankful uh, for who you are and for the ministry that you have um, in us and for us and through us. Um, God, help us to trust your amazing power. Uh, help us to trust your leading. Uh, help us to follow in the direction that you would want us to go. And just like you said in Luke 24, 49, uh, help us to wait on you. The disciples, it was waiting in a specific city. But Lord, to us, we recognize that we just need to wait for you and to make sure that we have your power to take the next step. Because Lord, in and of ourselves, we will screw up. Uh, our sinful nature will just mess things up. But Lord, thankfully, you gave us the wonderful gift, not only of salvation through your son, but Lord, you give us the gift and the power of your Holy Spirit, that we can talk to you now, that we can follow your direction, and Lord, that we can just have confidence that we are with you every step of the way, and that you, more importantly, are with us every step of the way, and that you're not weak, or that you won't fail us, but that we can know that we have your power. Lord, thank you for who you are. Uh, thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.